Yes, I have a question uh, uh, that's uh, based on a personal experience. I live next door to an abandoned house in uh, southeast Minneapolis. The mortgage servicer or non-servicer is Bank of, Amer of America. No payments have been made on the mortgage in over two and a half years. And only now has the Bank of America uh, servicing division started the foreclosure process. Does Dodd-Frank do anything to hold these banks accountable? Because as the next door neighbor, I am uh, uh, subject to involuntary servitude. I have to mow the lawn. I have to shovel the sidewalk. Uh, I have to make sure the property doesn't get uh, broken into and set on fire because then my house gets burned down too. Thank you. No, there are, are certainly a lot of issues as a result of the financial crisis uh, with regard to the kind of properties that you're describing. The short answer to your question is there's really nothing specific in the Dodd-Frank Act to deal directly with that problem, but there are a number of supervisory efforts that are underway to deal with the problem of people that are under wa water on their mortgages and properties that have been abandoned. So there are efforts to deal with that, but not specifically in the Act. Brother, with respect to rulemaking, mm -hmm. I understand the courts have imposed some additional requirements as to how you should handle those, um, those, those comments you received. Um, I understand that, there, that the courts are requiring you to give greater attention to the comments to, and extension, attention to, to which the result would actually bring rulemaking to a, to a stop. Well, I'm not... I'm not aware of, of anything that the courts have done specifically with regard to the comment process. What has happened, and, and this could also potentially have a very significant impact on the process, as I suggested, some of the SEC rulemakings have been challenged about the adequacy of the cost-benefit analysis that they've done. And I mean, this is one of these things where the devil is in the details. I mean, obviously, as we think about how to implement, I mean, remember, we're writing these rules because Congress has said we have to write these rules. As you think about how you write the rules, I mean, certainly we all want to write the rules in a way that maximizes the benefit of the rules and minimizes the cost of the rules. But as you begin to work through that process, quantifying uh, in a hard dollar sort of way either costs or benefits for many of these things. I mean, think about the Volcker rule and what I talked about in terms of proprietary trading, how exactly you define the term proprietary or speculative. And that it can get very challenging uh, to actually be able to implement those kinds of requirements. And so that kind of additional um, scrutiny of the rulemaking process can, in fact, make it much more complicated. I think with regard to the comments, the biggest issue it's just the sheer volume of the comments. I mean, for many of these, we've received literally tens of thousands of comments. And, you know, while some of those are form letters, so that may in some sense overstate somewhat the comment, I mean, thousands and thousands of them are individual comments. They're all read. The issues in them are distilled. And when the final rulemaking goes forward, the principles that decide on the rule receive a summary of all that commentary and how the staff is proposing to respond to it. So it does create a tremendous amount of work, but that's the nature of the rulemaking process. That's why we put out draft rules and then put out final rules. And I think that process enhances the quality of the final regulations, but it also requires a lot of work. Would there be any benefit to the United States to go back to Glass-Steagall, or is that just too simplistic for Well, there are complex? certainly people, I'm, I'm going to avoid sort of offering my own policy prescriptions tonight. There are certainly people that are advocating that. There are certainly people that are having, I mean, going back to Glass-Steagall basically means separating commercial and investment banking, uh, which is a separation that we had in this country for many years. I think, I mean, all of these proposals break up the banks into smaller pieces, try to manage their systemic risk, go, go back to Glass-Steagall. You know, are ways to try to narrow the scope of these largest firms and better get our hands around systemic risk. The opponents to going back to Glass-Steagall would probably argue that in some sense, you know, that genie is sort of already out of the bottle and the way markets and the way business, at least in this country, have evolved, it would be very difficult to recreate that separation. Ms. Lloyd, thanks for your insight into all this. Would you talk a little further about what tools to manage these SIFI firms? You mentioned the reserves. You mentioned carve-outs to 
what was supposed to be hard fast. Right. So I mean, the so, the so I mean, for for the SIFI firms, the act does a couple of things. First, it makes it for many of these firms, you didn't have the Fed or someone like the Fed as their regulator. So now any firm, so any bank, we, we were the whole, the supervisor of the bank holding companies over 50 billion because we supervise all bank holding companies. But for an AIG or something like that, if they were, even if they had been viewed as systemically important before the act, we wouldn't have been their supervisor. We would now be the supervisor going forward. So you have a clear designation of supervisory responsibility. You have the requirement in the act that they hold more capital, that they have higher liquidity standards, you know, so that the, the standards, the restrictions on them are higher in the act. And then the Fed is given the authority, in addition to that, to impose even higher standards if it views that as necessary. We have some other provisions which I think are less likely to be used on a regular basis, but we have the authority. Uh, if we view one of these firms as a grave threat to financial stability under the language that's used in the act, we can force divestitures within that firm. So we can basically break the firm apart. Um, so we have a variety of provisions like that which are intended to try to help manage the risks that these firms create. Thank you. You're welcome. You mentioned that um, there are a number of agencies that are addressed under Dodd-Frank, not just the Fed. Right. Would you enumerate or name the, the agencies involved in uh, having to agree on the rules for Volcker and for Title I and II? So some of the firms, I mean, so first off, for, for many of these banking regulations, you've got the three principal federal banking regulators. So in addition to the Federal Reserve, you've got the FDIC, and the Office of the Comptroller of Currency, the OCC. So you've got those three banking regulators. Then in addition to that, in many cases, uh, for these provisions, you have the SEC, uh, you have uh, the CFTC, uh, you have, I mean, those are probably the principal ones, but, but so you have the securities regulators and the banking regulators for something like Volcker needing to come together on that. You have some of the same issues with regard to derivatives regulations and some of the other areas. But for, for many of the bank-related regulations, it's that agreement across the banking regulators. So the Fed, the FDIC, and the OCC. Uh, with the Fed being asked to do uh, a lot of things that hasn't traditionally been done, is there any fear amongst the Fed or with you personally that it'll lead to uh, more interference with the Fed's main roles or with its autonomy from Congress or from other agencies? I mean, I, I think any time you take on additional responsibilities and additional responsibilities uh, that are challenging, uh, there's always uh, the risk of that creating both political pressure uh, and scrutiny if we don't do the roles well. So I think that risk is there. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Fed's view is that better managing systemic risk going forward is absolutely essential to the viability of our economy. We feel that it's a challenging role, but it's one that we're probably uniquely situated to take on. And so we've taken it on, but at least, again, here speaking just for myself, not without some trepidation, because I think it's very challenging to do, and you know, you're always going to be subject to second guessing if you don't do it as well as with the benefit of hindsight somebody feels you should have. Um. What do you feel is the single biggest risk to the economy right now, and do you guys feel like you're adequately prepared to handle this risk? Well, I think if you look at financial stability, um, I, I think that the risks to the economy are probably the risks that are cited uh, by FSOC in its annual report that it issued last, last month. Um, I think, you know, obviously in terms of the economy more broadly, just the functioning of the economy. The thing that we've been struggling with really since the financial crisis is, you know, the Fed has a dual mandate. Uh, so we're responsible both for price stability, uh, for controlling inflation, uh, but also for you know, maximum employment consistent with, you know, economic growth. And so that, that second uh, part of the dual mandate uh, the question of the level of employment has been 
where this economic recovery has been very unusual. Um, things have simply, remember I said at the beginning of this presentation that we lost 9 million jobs. Uh, we're simply not seeing the unemployment rate come down. And so I think that continues to be a significant concern for the Fed in terms of the execution of its monetary policy and the reason uh, that we have worked as hard as we have with some of the really extraordinary uh, efforts that we've undertaken to try to continue to move the economy forward. I guess uh, I'm next. Okay. Uh, I don't see anybody in this room that's 100 years old, so they won't remember what a bucket shop is, but I think you probably know, and uh, basically they were betting parlors in New York in 1906 where people could go in, speculate on the price movements of a stock, and uh, do it without any collateral. Uh, the Attorney General of the state of New York uh, now regulates that and hopefully puts it out of business as illegal gambling. But uh, there isn't much difference between credit default swaps as executed by AIG and bucket shops. In fact, there's no difference. And given that, I'm wondering whether there is any ability of the Fed or anybody else, any other regulatory agency to pierce the veil of the K Street lobbyists who just put a new label on the same old scam. I mean, we now have five different new agencies on top of the sleepy ones that didn't do their job the last time. So these agencies will cost the, the, the taxpayers $200 million a year. Should I believe that anything will change? I, I, I'm working to discern the specific question that was there. Um, so I, I mean, I think your question was skepticism about Either. Defining assets, let's, let's put it that way, defining assets. You, supposedly your people audit the balance sheets of these banks. Yeah. Why should we believe that your auditors know what they're doing? Well, um, I guess you'll have to decide what you choose to believe. I mean, we have extraordinarily talented, uh, dedicated employees that we train extensively uh, to supervise these institutions. That said, I think one of the things that we've seen is that for the largest banks in this country, uh, these banks uh, that are deemed too big to fail, these are extraordinarily complicated firms both to manage and to supervise. And that's part of the reason that you see some of the provisions that you do in the Dodd-Frank Act uh, to try to better address some of those challenges. But it's also why, as I said at the, at, during that part of the presentation, there's considerable sentiment in this country that we haven't fully resolved the too big to fail issue and a variety of proposals that are still outstanding to take additional steps to try to address that. So the people in the Federal Reserve, the people in the other regulatory agencies, and I can say this from firsthand experience, these are extremely dedicated, very competent people that work extraordinarily hard to do their jobs. But some of this is very challenging. Uh, but you know, if you're questioning the commitment of, of these people to do the very best they can uh, to do this work. I mean, that, that's just not, not the case. I mean, these are extremely dedicated people. You mentioned that in um, Section 313, it limits the resolution authority of the Federal Reserve for non-bank uh, institutions. Is that accurate? Um, it said that involved the uh, Treasury Secretary, and I was just wondering if Oh, the, the lending authority. So, yeah, the overnight lending authority. So in Section 13.3, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the reference initially. In Section 13.3, yeah. uh, what the Dodd-Frank Act did was really two things. One, we could no longer lend to individual firms, and two, if we establish a program targeted at a broader segment of the markets or the economy, which we can still do under Section 13.3, we can only do that with the concurrence of the Secretary of Treasury. That's okay, correct. my question is, including the Treasury Secretary under that circumstance, is that for something like capital injections, so you won't have to go to Congress for TARP? Or is that something... Well, TARP, I mean, TARP isn't something that we set up under Section 13.3. I mean, TARP was a... Oh, I understand that, but was, I'm just was, saying, you know, in the so, future, if you had to do that one more time, with the purpose of that part of that law... Well, I mean, I, I think the question would be, you know, if Congress created in the future, uh, something like TARP. I mean, obviously when it created TARP, I mean, it can create whatever restrictions or limitations 
on a fund like that that it wants. So I think one of the things that you see here, and you might reasonably speculate that this would be the case going forward, is less autonomy or less discretion for the Fed to act unilaterally. I mean, more of an involvement by the Treasury Secretary or by others in that process. So it's certainly possible that if Congress in the future, uh, hopefully we won't see the need for that again, but if there was something like that established to try to recapitalize firms, that you would see multiple decision makers involved in that. You might see Congress deciding that it wanted uh, some sort of continuing oversight of that process as well. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. I have three fairly similarly related questions about okay. the uh, debit interchange fee. Yeah. Um, first of all, debit card fees are usually significantly less than credit card fees as far as what, what the merchant gets out of it. Do you know why just debit card was looked at and credit cards were not put into there? I actually don't know why Senator Durbin, when he introduced uh, this legislation, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that information is out there. I don't know why it was limited just to debit cards. Okay, and then as far as debit cards for credit unions, do they follow the same rules that for a credit union versus a bank? So if you look at the way that the debit interchange provisions were provided, they actually, the formal regulations only apply to larger institutions. Uh, so they don't literally apply uh, probably to most credit unions because they're too small. I think the threshold was $10 billion. That said, there's been a lot of debate about whether or not that carve-out would really work in practice. So in theory, a, a small institution issuing a debit card would not be constrained by this reasonable and proportionate limitation that the regulation imposes on the size of the fee. They could charge a larger fee. The question, I think, becomes whether in reality, in the competitive dynamics of the marketplace, a small firm would actually be able to do that. Right, and that was actually part of my third question is, whose responsibility is that? So the, the players, as far as the way credit card machine, you know, it works with the merchants, is there's usually a company that operates the credit card machines, and then there's Visa and MasterCard, and mm -hmm. then there's the bank or the institution where the money's coming from. So as far as dividing that up between those under 10 billion and those not, is that the bank's responsibility to say, oh, nope, I get more money because we're under 10 billion? Is that the processor's responsibility? Do you know where well, that you, debate is at? And I mean, I'll confess you're taking me a little deeper into the implementation <laughs> specifics of these provisions that I'm probably prepared to go, or maybe that even if I could answer that, then people here want to go. I, I don't really know. Okay. Uh, the last I heard, it's kind of still up for debate and nobody really knows, so I wasn't sure if you knew. Yeah, I, I don't know the specifics of how if you have, I mean, I think you're asking if you have a processor and it's dealing with both firms that are subject to the constraint and firms that aren't administratively, how does it differentiate? I just don't know that level of detail. Okay. Great presentation about systematic risk. Uh, however, this doesn't explain Section 1502 conflict minerals. In addition, why is the SAC ahead of this, and who really is going to instill this regulation? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. It's just all one. Explain, you, you explained that all these provisions were put in, except it doesn't explain why Section 1502 Conflicts Mineral Act was put in as well under the miscellaneous. It has nothing to do with systematic risk at all. Well, I mean, I, I suspect, although that's not a provision that I'm intimately familiar with, that what you probably have there, I mean, to the extent that you have a provision in the act that seems to bear no relationship to the financial crisis, I think what you have is the same dynamic that we talked about with regard to debit interchange. I mean, you have a large piece of legislation that's gained a certain amount of momentum as it's moving through Congress. And, I mean, we see this with all, almost all legislative initiatives. It becomes an attractive vehicle to attach riders and amendments to or other things that people want to move forward, which might or might not uh, get enough support to move forward on their own. So I, I think that's what that provision is doing in there, not because it had anything specifically to do with the financial crisis, but because it was added as an amendment to the act. Uh, and as the overall act was created, it may or may not have received much attention. Um, but then it was enacted as part of the overall legislation. And once it's the law, it's the law. <laughs> 
First of all, thank you very much for your hard work in trying to protect all of us. Oh, you're working hard in doing that. I know how difficult it is. Could you comment on a couple of the major threats, cyber risks, and the global risks? Well, I mean, let me let me say with regard to, to cyber risks, which is one of the things, as I noted, FSOC mentioned in its annual report. I think this is an area uh, where, while we've been aware of these risks for quite a while, I mean, this is something that, for the country as a whole and for the financial industry, I mean, we've seen this as a growing area of exposure. And it takes a couple of different forms. One of the things that's been in the press in the last few months is some very aggressive, very sophisticated denial of service attacks that have been launched against a number of the large financial institutions in this country. Without getting into too much detail, I mean, frankly, the sophistication and the bandwidth that, that these attacks are using, and they're coming from overseas, it is really unprecedented. Now, the financial firms have been working among themselves, working with the government, and I think their ability to respond to those is getting better. Uh, but that's one of the things when people talk about cyber threats, that you know, challenge from overseas to try to take down part of the financial structure or impede its functioning is one of the challenges. Another thing that you know, people certainly worry about, this didn't involve US institutions, but there's a story in the press today about two banks out of the Middle East uh, that were hacked uh, in the last six months. Uh, people got access to the debit card infrastructure in these firms, were able to pull the limits off debit cards in these firms, and basically they had groups of thieves around the world who in the course of a couple of days pulled over 45 million dollars out of ATMs. Um, so they got it, they got hacked and they lost 45 million dollars basically almost overnight as a result of that compromise. So that's, you know, their, their security defenses against whatever, and I don't know the specifics of the nature of the compromise, but somebody was able to get into their system and then you know, create, I mean, you could basically go up and use a card. You had the access codes uh, these conspirators did in these ATMs, and you could pull out basically as much money as was in the ATM. And they very quickly uh, across the world pulled out close to $45 million. So the denial of service attacks, uh, these kind of hacking incidents, these are all threats that financial institutions and we as a country need to be more attuned to because they represent a very real challenge to us that we need to continue to up our game to try to respond to. In the FSOC, you say they issued their first report last month. They issued actually their second annual report. Well, second annual report, but it was issued last month. Yep. Is that available to the public? Yes. And how would one go about getting a copy? Do you know how to do a Google search? No. Okay. I'll send you the link. You'll send it to me? We, we take care of our retirees. Thank you. Uh, leave well, me your email address before you leave, and I'll send right. you the link. In fact, uh, I'll send you the report. Second, we hear a lot about uh, Tier 1 capital and Basel 1, Basel 2, and those kind of Basel things three. that I uh, don't understand anymore. But uh, he, used to be, he used to be head of our exam function, so uh, he, prob <laughs> he probably understands more than he's allowing. Here, I, I assume that that applies to the banks. Yes. The holding companies that are over the banks, is there a similar capital Yeah, these uh, capital standard, standards would apply, standard would apply. For the holding company also? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you can't leverage the holding company over the top of the bank anymore? You, you can't, yeah. I mean... What, one of the old issues, Les was very hawkish on this, was putting too much debt in one bank holding companies on top of small community banks. You can't do that to the extent that you could anymore. And certainly these big firms can't do that over these large banks that they're part of. These, these capital standards apply to the entire financial organization. Very good. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much.